maybe run through a couple housekeeping items. Cassie, if you want to advance to the next slide. Um, so last meeting, we had a couple different methods for, for chiming in if you wanted to share something, and we talked a lot about the raise your hand function. This evening, we're live streaming our meeting, which is really exciting. Folks can be watching just like any other public meeting um, and watching the action as it happens, but that does mean that it changes somewhat our hosting capabilities. So to make it um, as easy as possible and to make sure we have a clear record of who wants to speak and when, I'm going to ask that you use the chat function this evening in, and let us know um, if you have a comment that you'd like to make or a question. Okay, make I think sure I'm good. Thanks for your help. Uh, make sure to the best of your ability that you have that chat box open and you are able, you don't have to type in your question or comment. You can just type in, <coughs> I have a question or I'd like to say something <coughs> and I'll have a running, a running uh, log of those and when we pause or we open it up for discussion, I'll facilitate that portion and have people go in order. So, try not to raise your hand. It's okay if that's the only way that you can see if you are having issues with chat, um, but, and Liz will help me out with that, but please do try to use the chat box as much as possible to let me know if you have something that you'd like to say. Um, I can see most of the folks, and I think almost everybody is on mute, but if you're not uh, speaking, we just ask that you put yourself on mute so that we can limit ambient noise, babies, dogs, spouses, people doing construction in your home at 6 o'clock in the evening, whatever is going on. Um, and let's see, I think we just did live streaming and recording, so do know that you're being recorded this evening, CCS members, uh, but, and people will be hearing your voice and some of the discussion we're having is part of our public record. We've also got Laura uh, taking notes this evening and making sure that we have a record of our conversation. Kathy, am I missing anything? I think you're you're good to go. I would just see if anybody has questions before we proceed about just the functionality and everyone's feeling good. Folks feeling good? I can see a lot of you. So if I see some nodding heads, you can give me a little thumbs up. Great. Thanks, folks. I appreciate that. Okay, so let's keep it moving. Um, and I think up next, we're looking at our um, meeting objective for this evening. So this. This is, this is a potentially a big meeting. We're going to review quite a bit of um, the analysis and the scoring results of the different alternatives. And if we get there this evening, uh, the hope is that you as a group can make a recommendation on a preferred bridge alternative and the traffic option during construction. As Heather mentioned in the last meeting, we do have another meeting that we can use um, if needed after this. So by all means, we want to make sure that you as CTF members feel like you've had enough time to discuss and um, your charter hopes that you can get to a consensus-based recommendation. So we want to be sure that you have the time to talk through any considerations that you might have um, and just feel comfortable making a recommendation. But our hope is that if you feel ready, you feel like you have the information that you need and we have enough time to discuss that we do get to a recommendation this evening. So it will be action-packed and fun the best of our ability. <laughs> All right. Next slide. Great. So um, we're going to do a little round of introductions in a second. For this, I'd ask folks, you're going to see up on your slide, I think everybody can see the PowerPoint. You should be able to see the PowerPoint. So I'm just going to ask you to say your names in order when we get to that, and we're just going to test, say your name, what organization or group that you're representing. Um, as we typically do, and we'll run through our introductions, and I'll ask the project team to do the same so we can know who's in the room with us this evening. Um, we're going to do an abbreviated public comment. We yeah. did get receive some public comment that was emailed around to CTF members, and I'll provide a brief summary of that. Uh, and for folks who might be watching the live stream, you are always welcome to submit public comment before or after the meeting, and the, uh, the team will make sure that that is circulated uh, with the rest of the CTF. So feel free to submit that to the email um, on the project website. And then we're going to talk a bit about the scoring process and the results. You're going to hear quite a bit from uh, Jeff and Steve this evening, so buckle up. I know it's, uh, it can be a lot of information, but we'll make sure that it, we're pausing for Q&A along the way and use that chat box to let me know if you have a question. Um, and then we're going to have some time for discussion, potentially a recommendation if the group feels like they're ready to go there and then close this out and have you on your way to enjoy the rest of your uh, Monday evening at home. All right, questions on that? 
smile if there anything from the group. Okay, Susan Lindsay has a question. Sorry, go ahead. Who has a question? I'm, I'm having issues with my screen. Um, but yes, if you have a question, yes. go right ahead. Um, well, I think the question that I had was at the last meeting that we had, uh, you brought in a new alternative and there was a great deal of information. I don't remember any taking place at the meeting. It seemed like much more it was a presentation of information around the alternatives, including the new alternative. get started to the team member not not to the, it seemed like a little bit of a rush to um, when the uh, advisory group hasn't had a chance even to discuss what took place last meeting to be now we're making a decision tonight rushed to to any of you So I think, Susan, you're asking, you're kind of opening that up um, to the wider group uh, to see if folks are feeling like they might be rushed or is that directed to the project team specifically? Yeah, to the project team. Uh, I know that I know that I was quite surprised because I, the last meeting we didn't have any discussion time. So um, when I saw that this meeting was sort of advertised that the preferred alternative may be decided tonight, I thought, is that, uh, is that, is that what all of you thought? I mean, sort of where, I, I guess my question is, where did that come from? I didn't know that we were going to. Mm -hmm. hey, Allison. Um, yeah, go ahead, Mike. Take, this is Mike Pullen. Um, th Susan, thanks for uh, raising that issue. We have that extra meeting in June. So it's definitely not a requirement that the task force make a recommendation tonight. We've just um, detected that it feels like some people might be ready. So if people are ready tonight, it could happen tonight. If people would like more time to discuss it and mull it over, we definitely have that June meeting. So um, no pressure. It just it could happen tonight or it could happen in June. Well, just just a final point on that, Mike. Did I miss something in between the last meeting and now? I mean, was there some discussion that I don't? wasn't a part of or something because we did not discuss things the last time we just we listened to the presentations they were very interesting but they were some of it was new so was there right. no, no there hasn't been anything since that april 27 meeting this is the the next meeting after that one right. so like, like i said if it if it feels like there's a need for more discussion that's definitely within your prerogative so don't feel pressured and just um i think allison will kind of take the temperature of the group after the uh, Steve and Jeff did their presentation, so it's quite all right to wait until June, the June meeting, if, if that's what the group would like to do. All right, thanks, Mike. Thanks. Okay, so we will be checking in and just making sure folks are feeling good. Some people might be ready, some might not be ready, and we want to be sure that the whole group feels comfortable moving forward. So thank you for that, Susan. Okay, Cassie, can we go to the next slide? Okay, so let's try this out. Um, I think all of you can see the, the slide that's up right now. So what I'm hoping that we can do is we can just go in order. We're gonna start things off with art. And if somebody's not here, I will verbally note that for the record, but just go ahead and say your name and turn your video on if you're able to and, um, and say hello. And we'll just go around in a circle. So Art, why don't you kick us off with our introduction? Hi, I'm uh, Art Graves. I'm with the Multnomah County Bike and Ped Citizen Advisory Committee. Uh, this is Cameron Hunt. I'm with the Portland Spirit. We got Dan here this evening. Okay, I think Dan is not here. So next up, I can see you, Ed. <laughs> Ed, Ed and Sharon are here. They're, they're muted. They are meeting. Um, Fred? Good evening. Fred Cooper, representing the uh, Laurelhurst Emergency Team and the Laurelhurst Neighborhood Association. I'm uh, the, on the board and treasurer of the organization. 
Gabriel Ray, Burnside Skate Park. Howie Beer, Matt Martin, Director of Portland Saturday Market. Hey, Paul Lightman, Oregon Walks. Paul. I'm Jennifer Stein. Um, I'm with Central City Concern. Hi, good evening. This is Rob McDonald, uh, Operations Manager, American Medical Response here in Portland. Hi, good Rob? evening. Marie Dodds, AAA, Oregon, and I represent 700,000 drivers in Oregon. Hi, everyone. It's Kelly Wilson with the Portland Business Alliance. Peter, you're up next. I think you're still muted, Peter. There you go. You got me? Okay, it's Peter Brown with Central East Side. Thanks, Peter. Sharon? Sharon Wood Wortman, can you hear me? We can hear you. That's great. Okay. Thank you. Stella Butler with the Coalition of Gresham Neighborhood Associations. Okay, I'm going to pause because we skipped Neil, who's been here. Since the beginning. Neil, you're on mute. Okay, 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 okay. Is that me? Ooh. I think we can hear you now. Okay, good. Okay, good. Okay, good. Okay, good. Getting some feedback, so we're going to mute you, but we can see you. Sounds like you're here, and we will uh, sort that out in a minute. Um, Susan, you're up next. Trying to turn on my. Ah, there, Susan Lindsay, Buckman Community Association. Reporting from the farm. Thank you, Susan. <laughs> Tasha, are you here? Hi, Tasha Eisenberg, Mercy Corps. Sorry, all I can't seem to get my video to show my face, but I'm here. Just imagine your face. Thanks, Tasha. Timothy, are you here? Don't think we have Timothy. Okay, but we do have Bill. Bill, you're on mute still. Working? Yeah. Can you hear me now? We can hear you now. Yeah, I'm Bill Burgo, Portland Freight Committee. Thank you, Bill. This is Neil again. And I just figured out the mute on mute. We're still experiencing some feedback, but. Um, We'll maybe have Liz reach out to you. I think there might be something going on, Neil. Um, okay, thank you all for, for indulging that um, meetings in the time of, of COVID. So thank you for your patience with that. We've got some uh, project team members. I'll just briefly run through who's in the room this evening. We have um, some folks from Multnomah County. We've got Ian and Mike and Megan on the line. Um, we also have Heather, Cassie, Steve, um, and Jeff, are there any other project, and myself, Allison Brown, are there any other project team members in the room? Oh, Liz is here, also offering any tech support if you need any assistance. Uh, Laura is here too. Oh, Laura's here. Hi, Laura. Laura's taking notes for us this evening. Okay, I think we're all here. Hopefully for folks who are live streaming the meeting and tuning in, you have a good sense of who's on the CTF and some of the project team members. Okay, Cassie, can we head to the next slide? You're also welcome to turn your videos off if you'd like at this point, CTF members. Go right ahead. Um, so we are not taking verbal public comments in this meeting, but we did receive one um, written piece of comment from uh, Pacific Coast Fruit Company. That letter was circulated with CTF members, um, and it will be posted as part of the meeting packet online if you're interested, in, any members of the public interested in reading that. Um, and the letter is, explains a little bit about their origins and their history and their values and really underscores how their central east side location is critical to their success. So um, something for CTF members to take into consideration as they look at um, any potential impacts to businesses on both sides of the river, but uh, Pacific Coast Fruit Company is really underscoring. Very okay. We're into some weird feedback, but just keep yourselves on mute if possible, and we'll keep.
keep it going. And a reminder to members of the public, you're always welcome to submit public comment, um, and it will be circulated to a CCF member. Hey, Kathy, can we go to the next slide? All right. Um, so I think this, I'm going to pass this over to Heather to give a little bit of an update on our timeline and process. So Heather, over to you. Thank you, Allison. Um, all right, community members, I know you're very familiar with this slide since we've been in process for a while. This is just a reminder, um, as Allison and Mike have said, we're at our main meeting where we are going to discuss the scoring results of the alternatives. Um, if as a committee tonight you feel like you're ready to make a recommendation for a preferred alternative, we'll move forward with that this evening and come back together in September. Um, if we need, uh, as a committee, you need more discussion, then we will come back in June to have more discussion uh, around recommending a preferred alternative before we go out to the public this summer. So again, we can come back to you this fall with that public input, and then you could make your formal recommendation to the policy group uh, in October so that we can publish our draft EIS in 2021 with that preferred alternative. And I would just like to acknowledge for everyone um, the, you have been working uh, towards this milestone now for 18 months. I think this is your 15th meeting. So uh, kudos to everyone for being with us um, and getting us to where we're at tonight. I think the next slide. All right, and just as a reminder, since we are going to be sharing the scoring results tonight, and then Steve and Jeff are going to be working with you to talk about some of what the um, kind of key uh, findings are as how the, how the alternatives scored. Um, I know we spent some last time at our last meeting talking about key differentiators, and now is just the time to kind of dive a little bit deeper into the scoring results. Um, again, the, the scoring results are a tool for you uh, to aid you in your decision making, and so that's what we're uh, looking for tonight. Um, and really, these results are based on the criteria uh, that you develop based on your values, the measures to rate the performance of those criteria. You all work to develop the weighting to, to reflect their relative importance. And then the team, along with agency staff and some CTF members' input, develop the ratings. Um, that are allowing us to go over the scores uh, tonight. On the next slide, it just shares a little bit of information about, to remind you of the weightings that you developed. And again, uh, they kind of fall in two categories. There's the long term, so once the project is completed, uh, as well as then the short term. So how did we wait, or how did you all wait the measures uh, as they relate during uh, construction of the project? Next slide. And the tool that you all have in your materials, um, I, we sent out uh, your meeting packets last week. Uh, it has all of the detailed scoring for all of the alternatives and the criteria. Uh, there's also an extremely detailed spreadsheet in there for people who are, who are interested to that level of detail. Um, and Kathy, if you go back to the last, the previous slide, um, so the results that we'll be going over tonight, really, it's just, again, taking the criteria. So here we have our seismic resiliency criteria, um, taking the measures to distribute the CTF weighting factors. We then rate those based on a one, three, or five, multiply those measures by the rating, and then really we just add those scores and apply a um, factor uh, of 20, which really is just to kind of get everything rounded out so that we can have a score ranging up to 100. It's just easier to see the scoring results instead of seeing uh, a bunch of small numbers with decimal points. So on the next slide, again, this is just the information in your packets that show how each alternative scored. The uh, graphic on the left is showing the um, enhanced seismic retrofit, and you can see specifically how it scored for each of our criteria and measures, and then on the right is that detailed scoring sheet that I was referring to. So again, this evening, your objective is um, 
to review this information and to discuss the results, and if you feel comfortable to work towards a recommendation. Your charter as a um, community task force um, aims that you work towards consensus-based recommendations. So in most of our votes, you have the thumbs up, thumbs to the side, or thumbs down um, options to vote. And we're going to do the same thing when you feel ready to vote here. We'll just do it verbally through our Zoom platform, or excuse me, through our WebEx platform. And remember that um, also per your charter, uh, if you have thumbs up option, it's going to you are in agreement um, of the recommendation. If you, if you vote with your thumb to the side, it notes that you, um, it might not be your favorite option, but you're willing to live with it. And if you do have any considerations or um, additional thoughts that you would like to share with your decision-making body, um, we can capture those as part of the record. So please do share those considerations if and when you get to voting. Um, know that it's not a yes or no. It can also be a yes, I agree with this, but there are some things that I'd like to share with um, the policy group and the Board of County Commissioners. So uh, just a reminder that when we cross that bridge and, and we're ready for it, we'll go through our voting protocols. But um, yeah, it's just something to keep in mind as we move forward. And, all right. So I think this is the this is the opportunity where we um, dive into the the meat of our meeting and talk through um, the scoring process and the results. But before we we get into that, are there any questions? From anybody or any comments? I'm not seeing anything in the chat. Okay, and I see most folks have their videos off, so you're probably enjoying a wonderful beverage at this time. So let's go ahead and keep it moving. So I think this is the time when I pass it to uh, Steve and or Heather. 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 Look at my notes, Heather. It's you. Heather, I think you're on mute still. Thank you. All right. You think I by now I'd have that down. All right. Okay. So um, before we kind of get into the real bulk of the conversation tonight, I just want to do want to touch on the alternatives we have, and um, maybe hopefully I'm going to clarify just a little bit what happened here with this fourth alternative. So we have our enhanced seismic retrofit, which is that first alternative, kind of in that purple box for you that can see the purple color. Then the two alternatives in the middle, we have our replacement short span and our replacement long span. And if you recall, at our February CTF meeting, when we, uh, at that meeting, we did talk about this long span uh, option. And the, the, those two replacements, the replacement short span and the replacement long span, those are really those replacement al uh, alternatives that replace the, uh, the Burnside Bridge in its current configuration and its current alignment. Now, it's a little wider, right? We have some additional width, but really other than that, it is in the same alignment of the bridge today versus the fourth one, which is the replacement cooch extension where we have, um, you know, straighten out that F curve. So in our February meeting, when we talked about the, what I'm going to call, to call the in-kind replacement, replacing the bridge as it kind of stands today with that, with that wider um, width for bikes and pedestrians, we did talk about this um, option of looking at a long span along with a short span as it relates to that in-kind replacement option. Um, and the reason why we talked about it at that meeting was because the design team, through some of the work they had been doing, found out, you know, looked at a long span as a possibility, and there were some, uh, some benefits uh, uh, to that, and, and we'll talk more in detail about that later tonight. And at the time, we were really just calling it an option of that in-kind replacement um, alternative. As we were moving forward and we were doing our scoring, and we were starting to talk about this publicly, it was getting confusing. Um, to kind of have this one subset option. And so we decided to just elevate that and make it its own alternative. Um, so, so again, we have tonight to, to, you know, to talk through any questions you have. We certainly can come back in June if the committee doesn't feel like we're ready, you're ready to make that recommendation tonight. Um, but I'm hoping maybe I provided a little bit of clarity about why 
now you're seeing that long span um, that was really an option kind of under that in-kind re replacement elevated um, to, the, to an actual alternative. So I'm going to pause there um, before I go on to the next slide to see if I, anybody has any, any questions about what I just said. Yes, Jackie, go ahead. Hey, I had a question. So is the long span, I was, I missed the February meeting. That was the meeting I was um, out of the country. Well, I guess I wasn't out of the country, but whatever. Okay, <laughs> I was out of town. Um, the long span, is that the one where we're talking about where it would go out, like it wouldn't have the same footings, it would go way past, like out to like fifth or sixth is where the it, where it would land? Is that the one we're talking no. about? That's a great question, Jackie. Um, for you can tell you've been with us for 18 months <laughs> as we've evolved. So um, early on, when we first started it um, in some of our first meetings, when we when the project had gone had the feasibility phase where we looked at kind of over those hundred different options, and that ended up the feasibility phase ended up recommending four alternatives to move forward. One of those alternatives was the high six bridge. And Jackie, I think what you're asking about is that high six bridge, and that was the bridge that because it wasn't a movable bridge, because all of the four that are up here are movable, that was the one that got so tall that the approaches got really long. Yeah. So the long span, and Steve was gonna, he's, we have lots of graphics here a little later on where Steve can touch on what the long span looks like um, or, or, or feels like. Um, it's, it's as far as kind of the landing of where it lands, it still lands in the same place. Um, it's just a different kind of uh, type of bridge that allows more um, for us to basically have less tiers is ultimately kind of what it allows for. Uh, so I think I answered Jack Jackie's question because I got a thumbs up. Thanks, Jackie. All right, I think I'm going to go to the next slide. Um, so this is the last one I have before I turn it over to Steve and Jeff. And this is really to just show, again, based on all of the criteria and measures and ratings, how these four alternatives scored. And I just want to orient everyone. Um, so again, there's the four build alternatives. Um, the purple, or the first one on the left, being that enhanced seismic retrofit. The next one, the one that is in the green, is our replacement in-kind short span. The one in the blue is the replacement in-kind long span. And then the one, the far right one, is the replacement cooch extension in the yellow. And the reason why there's two sets of numbers is, um, you all know, is we've been working towards um, this preferred alternative recommendation, there's really two parts to it. There's which alternatives that you would all like to recommend move forward, along with what traffic management option should move forward. So should we, and those traffic management options are really related to, do we provide some type of temporary detour bridge configuration, or do we have a full closure of the Burnside Bridge and have traffic detour to other routes? So the lighter color boxes, so if you go to the retrofit, um, that kind of light box that has the 53, that's how the retrofit alternative is scored with some type of temporary bridge. The darker color score, that 61, is showing how the retrofit alternative is scored with a full bridge closure, so detouring traffic away from the site. So if you look at just based on the scoring results, that 82 or that kind of darker blue bar, that is the in-kind replacement with the long span type and a full closure, so no detour bridge. That is the uh, alternative that scored the highest um, based on the criterion measures and ratings um, that were developed as part of this committee. So Allison, I'll see if there's any questions, and if not, then Jeff and Steve are really going to kind of get into how things scored or why things scored or, you know, some of the highlights so that the committee can uh, ask questions about the results. I'm not seeing anything in the chat, 
just a reminder to use that chat box um, to let us know if you have a question or comment. Or as Jackie did, turn on your video and let us know that you're here. There we go. I knew that there would be one. Okay, Bill, go right ahead with your question. Well, I was curious about the, um, I mean, the criteria, I presume we voted on that. Is that correct? And was length of time, go ahead. I'm sorry, I, I guess I should say, you developed, we worked with you to actually develop the criteria. Yeah, and where, where in the waiting on all this was the length of time that, was that also one of the criteria? Did we, we include length of time uh, from the time we uh, take the bridge out of service until completion? Is that included in these, uh, in what we're seeing here? That was one of the measure, uh, one of the criterion measures that were used were, was around length of time for construction bill is what I'm assuming you mean? Well, from the time, you know, the traffic gets detoured until the traffic gets rerouted back onto the new bridge. Uh, I mean, I, I assume that that's in, in this waiting somehow, somewhere. It is, and that's part of what Steve and Jeff are going to be presenting here in just a, in just a minute. Okay. All right, I'm not seeing any other questions um, from folks. So I think with that, we'll turn it over to Steve. All right, so Allison, I'm gonna ask you to do one thing just to address Bill's question. Can you go back to slide number 11, please? Back to the sheet that has titled Evaluation Process and Results um, that has the detailed scoring sheet on it. I want to do a quick explanation of how we can go um, answer Bill's question. So I'm not sure who is. Kathy, is that possible to go back to slide 11? Yeah, I am going back. All right, Bill, I'm going to I'm going to remind everyone of what we've done. So those bar graphs you just saw is a culmination of all those little scores that are shown on the right side there, that detailed scoring matrix. And so there's a total of over 80 measures that were taken into account and rated with a one, three or five that, that eventually rolled up using all of the weighting factors that got into those composite scores. Each one of those color codings on the right hand side represent one of those bars that you saw rolled up. So there were quite a few different measures that had an implication of time. How long is the construction duration, whether it's a temporary bridge or without a temporary bridge or for each of the alternatives. Um, during some of the topics where we talked about a vehicular or bike ped or whatever it was, there was an assessment on how long was the travel time for each of the different modes. And then we assessed a rating factor based on the, the criteria itself that you guys all developed. So all of that process is embedded into these 80 different um, measures rated with a one, three or five, ultimately rolling up to the score that you saw on that prior bar chart. So all of, the, all of this, this committee's work is in, midst, or in the midst of, of those bar charts. So, so that's how the process is, and then we'll look to explain a lot of that as we go now back up to slide 15 uh, to get into um, how did we get to that place and what do these different alternatives mean and what are the big highlights for each of the bridge alternatives. And Steve, before we do, um, Susan does have a question. Susan, over to you. Well, I think this is maybe a Jeff, Steve, and uh, Heather question. So I did look this over. Uh, beforehand, I, I still don't really get the long span, and I appreciate Heather you saying that it was sort of brought up or mentioned somewhere in February, but it really was last month was the first time I saw it, and I don't really get it. And it, to me, it's it's um, aesthetically kind of scary. So that's why uh, now I'm and I read the packet beforehand that it seems to have scored the highest. So I'm hoping you can um, break down for me, Jeff Steve slash Heather, uh, the scoring differences between short span and uh, long span, because I'm not seeing that there are that many points difference, but you can sort of tell me why 
all are really leaning towards that long span, which I, I personally think is aesthetically um, not so great. So uh, uh, please help me out as, as you go through the, as you break these down. Thank you very much. Perfect. And Susan, that's exactly what we are looking to, um, to do in this presentation. So let's just sort of jump right in. So on the next slide. Oh. I'm sorry. I just, I, I just like to clarify one thing really quick. Um, and, uh, cause Susan brings up a really good point. Um, I just want to be uh, clarified that the, as Steve mentioned, the scores really are based on how the rating were applied to the criterion measures that the committee developed. And these scores are, they're a tool to help you in your recommendation process, but they are not, um, this is this committee's recommendation, it's not the project team. Um, so it's not uh, meant to imply or show that we're leaning in one direction or another, it's really just to show the pure kind of numerical results. Um, of the scoring and then the, the discussion that you are all going to have tonight um, is really then to help aid you uh, to get to that preferred alternative recommendation. So I just wanted to, to really make it clear that, you know, this is, it's the committee's um, recommendation that we're really looking for tonight and that this is just a tool to help answer or questions you may have to help you get to that, to that recommendation. Um, so that's all. Thank you, Steve. Yeah, thank you for adding that. So the next few slides, we're going to talk about all the alternatives because they all relate some way to each of the topics that we'll talk about. So this first slide is about project cost. And similar to the graphic that had the scoring, this one also aligns in the, um, I guess it's purple, green, blue, and gold color, each of the different alternatives and what their cost is with two numbers, the lower number, you know, for retrofit, 895 uh, in millions, and then the upper number, 985, when you add a temporary bridge to that option. And so as you look across all of these, what you see is that the least expensive alternative is that long span. So that's one of the um, elements or features that goes with that long span relative to the short span, which again is very similar in terms of a plan view, similar layout, bridge ends are the same points. It's just the way the bridge girders are set and the locations, the columns are quite different. Um, so that replacement short span is more expensive by about $45 million. And then you get to the retrofit itself, which when we first started talking about this, thought that was going to be the least expensive, but it turns out to be uh, the third highest expensive and then ultimately the cooch extension being the most expensive in, in large part because it has the most bridge to it and bridge is fairly expensive. So this is one of the first findings when it, when it relates to project costs. So the cheapest being that replacement long span and the others incrementally get larger. Looks like there's a question. Go ahead, Fred, with your question. Uh, I don't think we can... Go ahead. You're referring to me, to Fred? Yes, please, Fred, go ahead. Um, earlier, we were told that the uh, temporary bridge would be in the 150, 160 million, and I'm not seeing this kind of number. Could, could you explain just what you're proposing here in the way of a temporary bridge? Is this pedestrian and bicycle only? Uh, no, so the temporary bridge is about 90 million. We thought it was going to be more than that, but the total cost of the temporary bridge is 90. It consists of uh, all traffic modes. So it's one lane each direction for vehicles, and we're allowing general purpose lanes, so any kind of vehicle, plus lanes for bikes, plus uh, room for pedestrians in both directions. So it's the full width uh, temporary bridge, and it's roughly 90 million. The Cooch extension is slightly more than that just because of some extra curvature and, and subtleties to it. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And then I think there was a question about uh, why exactly is the long span more expensive? It's a great question. Um, it has a lot to do with that geotechnical hazard zone. And I'll show this diagram um, once we get to the long span option. 
The geotechnical hazard zone that exists on the east side of the river is very, very deep, 120, 130 feet deep. And for every single support that you place into that hazard zone, you have to basically create an island of soil improvement around it. Very, very expensive. And uh, the more that you can reduce that underground cost, the more you can reduce even the foundation cost, you generally are saving money. Um, there's also some other features in terms of risks associated with utility relocations and some um, other modifications just based on, frankly, fewer supports in the ground relative to the short span. So, um, so that, that cost is a major driver for uh, why that, that long span option uh, came in less. And that, that uh, geotechnical soil hazard, which we'll show in sort of this goldenrod color in a few slides, is virtually uh, two thirds of the soil on the eastern side of the river. And there's a little sliver of it that's also on the west side. And so while it's, um, and so it's basically, it's, yeah, over the course of time, alluvium materials that have naturally deposited there because of the migration of the Willamette River uh, to the east and now back to where it currently is. So I think I answered one question and I saw a couple other flash up. Yeah, so it looks like we have a question um, that's following up on that if you're referring to a fill zone. And then a question on the cost, whether the cost of relocating the Saturday market is included in the temp bridge cost. Right. So I think I tried to take the, the fill zone question. It really is a geotechnical hazard zone based on where nature placed that, that sediment as opposed to man-made fill. Um, and I'll, I think it, the, the graphic that comes a little later will help describe where that area is and the foundations in it. Regarding Saturday market, um, one of the aspects of all of the all of the different alternatives, there's going to be an impact to Saturday market where it would have to be relocated. And that's whether it's the retrofit and the construction of the deep shafts in and around every single support that's underneath the bridge or the replacement of the deck above or a complete relocation or reconstruction of the bridge itself. Um, the Saturday market building is going to be an acquisition as part of this project. Um, and in its place, there's going to be a permanent ADA accessible ramp that frames down. And so those costs are taken into the project, regardless of whether it's a temporary bridge or not. All right, let's keep it moving. And we'll keep monitoring those questions in the chat. Thanks, folks. All right, so one of the key differences between a retrofit and a replacement is the bridge width itself. As we talked about before, the retrofit uh, can, maintains the existing hourglass shape on the bridge and has uh, lanes allocated and with dimensions as shown on the top. Each of the different replacements, uh, when we're taking a cross section, your mid span gets wider. So we're taking that hourglass shape and making it more rectangular. So it's constant all the way across and it results in about an eight foot additional space that's being allocated to the bikes and peds on either side on the outside. In addition to the, to the additional space for the replacement options, there's also the vehicular crashworthy barrier that separates traffic from the bikes and peds. And unfortunately, there's just not the space to do that on the retrofit. And so the delineators that are out there today would be maintained in the future with the retrofit alternative. All right, there was a, for all the alternatives, construction timeline is a, is a major factor as it related to each of the different criteria and measures that we were considering. So um, this graphic shows the two different options. One, the top part is a, uh, bridge closure or essentially no temporary bridge or the bottom has a temporary bridge. And you can see a difference of the retrofit, which are colored in the red, goes from three and a half years up to five years if you add the temporary bridge. And the replacements go from four and a half years up to six and a half years. So the takeaway is regardless of the alternative, there's, either, there's between a one and a half and a two year increase in total project construction time with the addition of a temporary bridge. And this is because you have to build that temporary bridge within in-water work windows in the Willamette River. 
you have very large elements that you have to span. You have a movable bridge that has to be built into it. Um, this additional time is for the construction and removal of those temporary bridge elements, plus the additional premium of time for staging on either end of the bridge, even on land, because of how you have to tie in between very constrained buildings. All right, so now we're going to get into each of the different alternatives and we're pretty excited. I guess I was told that I was going to be fun, exciting, and everyone should buckle up. So um, hopefully that's the case for everybody as we get into these graphics. Um, each one of the alternatives is going to have a series of graphics where we're taking a view like this, an isometric view of what the alternative looks like um, after construction, and then some zoomed in views of particular aspects that go with each one. So this, um, this view is after construction of the enhanced seismic retrofit. In essence, from, from where it looks today, it's similar to what's out there today. As you get closer, you'll find that each of the different elements on the bridge have, have gotten bigger, gotten thicker, either encased in concrete or a reconstruction of uh, the vessel, vessel collision system in the river, which is why that looks bigger. Um, and you'll see as we get into each one of the diagrams. So next slide, please. So this is the first graphic that really depicts where this geotechnical hazard zone is that's shown in this orange. Um, you can see it on both sides of the river. I'll call it light orange compared to the dark orange, which are the supports. So um, the, the light orange, that's the area that is prone to both liquefy, which basically means with an earthquake saturated soil of this type tends to turn into a soup. And then because of where the ground surface is, the hard rock surface is below, because it's inclined, it tends to flow towards the river. And this, this combination of turning to soft liquefiable soil and flowing called lateral spread creates this really large hazard um, that has to be designed for. And so the enhanced seismic retrofit, because it maintains all of its existing supports, um, you have to literally mitigate the soil, meaning you have to build in protective islands below ground to help um, support the piers in their current location and keep them from sliding along with this 100, 110, 120 foot amount of soil that wants to displace towards the river. And this happens on both sides. And this condition of the soil is there regardless of the alternative. So the alternative, each of the alternatives, the more columns that you actually have in this soil means the more work, the larger the, the foundations are and the more improvements have to be built to maintain the bridge where it is. Allison, it looks like I might have a question. Yeah, you've got a couple questions. One is just a reminder that if you're indicating on something, we can't see your hands. Um, but Jennifer, I'm not sure you're asking where public comment came from on this diagram. Um, I'm not sure if you want to pipe in to clarify, or if, if Steve, that makes sense to you. I'm not sure which public comment you're referring to specifically. I'm not sure about the public comment, but I will definitely try to raise my hands up and use it. I think what Jennifer is, this is Cassie, I think what Jennifer's referring to is where Pacific Coast Fruit is located in this picture, since that's where the public comment came Correct. from. Ah, Correct, thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you for that, thank you. So unfortunately, I don't have control of what you guys can see on the screen, uh, but I'm sure the hand can be moved. So the, right where the hand is, is a portion of the Pacific Coast Fruit Company um, that still remains after the mitigation work and after this project um, is constructed. So for this particular alternative, and frankly, for all of the alternatives, there is some amount of impact to the Pacific Coast Fruit Company's building on the north, and this is the northeast quadrant, as well as the AMR building to the south. And that's why in those spaces, you'll see them open. And this is a byproduct of what it takes for large construction equipment uh, to gain access to the site to actually perform the work for each one of the different alternatives. And so you'll see some form of space that is in these in these diagrams is a byproduct of what is going to be needed for construction. 
Looks like there's also a comment that um, some of the colors, it's hard to differentiate where the, the geohazard zone is. Um, so if you can just maybe help clarify some of that, that'll be great. Okay. Yeah, so, so moving on to the next slide. Um, one of the elements uh, that is key to this alternative as well is the fact that uh, there is a, an impact to Waterfront Park and what this view shows, which is a view looking from Natal Parkway towards the northeast, is um, how every single column that's going to be uh, that's in this in this view is going to be retrofitted, which really means strengthened with some form of concrete encasement, maybe a, a foot, maybe a foot and a half thick, and large diameter shafts uh, deep into the ground around the foundations. So. Uh, for every one of these alternatives, um, and especially for this particular alternative, the hand seismic retrofit, there's some form of an impact that happens to Waterfront Park that for some amount of time will uh, re require the closure of the area underneath the bridge. And in this particular case, uh, because of the amount of construction below ground and the number of columns that are built, it actually is one of the longer durations of actual impact with, with the park. And in this view, this is where we're now turning and looking at the uh, eastern half of the of the project. Uh, this is where there is in the top left picture uh, our partial replacement. And so all of these spans that are over the freeway and over the railroad are our replacement spans. And that's because again, there was no room to be able to build a retrofit in between the various lanes of the freeway or in, in the tracks. And so that's all the replacement piece of it. Um, also what's shown in this uh, diagram in the upper left, and it's a little tricky to see, but in the foreground, there's an ADA access ramp or what I call the East Bank Esplanade access bridge, because it's functionally gonna serve as a bridge that for every single alternative is gonna be um, constructed so that there is an ADA accessible ramp that goes to the East Bank Esplanade, as opposed to the stairs that are out there today. And so that's what we're building into the NEPA process. In the bottom right corner is a picture associated with um, Second Avenue and in orange or red, the Burnside Skate Park. And what that represents is because of the nature of the seismic retrofit we have to do, we have to uh, do so much work to that existing pier that it's not only going to just puncture the skate park, but the work needed to retrofit the bridge is going to actually destroy the skate park. And when we build back that pier, it's going to create a wall across the entire width of the skate park such that it's not uh, reconstructable in the space that remains. And Steve, looks like there's a question from Cameron in the chat on whether the big pipe sewer system um, would be impacted by any of these alternatives. Oh, great question. Um, the answer is no. The, the big pipes, the CSO pipes that exist on both sides of the river are constraints for us. And so there's an easement outside of it that we uh, that serves as a constraint. So we have to put all of our new foundations outside of those easement zones. And it became a challenge for some of our alternatives. It actually was the reason why we placed some of our column locations inside the park or even further to the east where we did because we had to remain outside of that CSO easement zone. Great question. And so with that, um, Jeff, I was gonna transition uh, this over to you to have you speak to some of the other uh, NEPA technical report issues. Okay, thanks Steve. Um, as long as we're on the skate park, I'll add a little bit more about historic resources and the uh, enhanced retrofit. As Steve mentioned, the retrofit is the only, only alternative, only permanent alternative that has uh, the physical impact on the skate park itself and so much so that it could not be rebuilt um, in a way that it could still function the way it does today. Some of the important elements of it would be uh, couldn't be replaced. Um, on the on the other side um, of the coin, Burnside is 
has the least impact on Burnside Bridge itself, which is also on the National Register of Historic Places. So that's a positive for the retrofit. All the replacement alternatives obviously completely removed the Burnside Bridge. A couple other historic cultural resource issues to consider with, with the retrofit are the retrofit like the other replacement bridges, like all the other replacement bridges, except the long span, because of all the, the columns that are in that geological hazard zone and the underground, the jet grouting, extensive jet grouting that's required. Uh, we don't know at this time what archeological or post-contact resources, cultural resources, archeological resources might be buried in there. But we do know that any jet grouting, it, 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 it's such a, a significant action that occurs there underground. Um, those buried resources would be lost with the retrofit or be damaged with the retrofit as well as the replacement, uh, the short span or the cooch. Only the long span uh, has the potential to minimize impacts there. If you could go to the next slide, the other thing I wanted to talk about on this is art. Uh, Graves had mentioned uh, in our last meeting that um, asked that we be sure to include some, some visuals and consideration of the impacts on the white stag sign, also called the Maiden Oregon sign. Uh, this is a resource that it's not currently on the National Register, but it's been recommended to be listed by our historic preservation team. It is not contributing, it's non-contributing to the historic district there, the landmark district. But nevertheless, it, it's, we think it's probably warrants um, to on its own to be on the National Regi Register of Historic Places. You can see from this simulation that uh, obviously the retrofit, like the short span and like the cooch, because there's no above deck structure, there is no change to the view from uh, the bridge itself. And when we get to the long span, we'll talk about how that that's different from all the other alternatives in terms of its impacts uh, on that sign. And those are the only additional things I felt like I needed to mention, but if there are any, any other questions about that. No questions at the moment. I think we can keep moving forward, Jeff. All right. And so now we're moving on to the replacement short span. And in contrast to the retrofit that is taking its, you know, 95 year old materials and then building on building around it and, and embedding into another hundred years of design life, the short span and the rest of these replace all of the features of the bridge um, with some sort of, you know, new modern uh, construction technique. In this case, it's just like the name suggests, a series of shorter spans comparable to what's out there today. So think of this as the most true to life sort of in kind, except that as shown in the bottom right corner, it doesn't necessarily have to be a bascule bridge. It could also be a lift type. And so these pictures on the bottom right are examples of what the lift or bascule could look like um, one of the things that will be happening regardless of which alternative is selected is a first a type selection phase that's going to get into a determination of whether it's a lift or bascule. That's not part of your recommendation as a part of this body. It might fold into a recommendation that comes later. And then beyond that, the actual aesthetics would happen during final design. So what exactly would, for example, a lift span look like? Well, that depends on where you would place the lift span and and various options for it. So we're not trying to ask you guys to consider what's your favorite look or even what's your favorite between a lift or a bascule. It's really what is the preferred alternative uh, replacement short span versus retrofit versus long span versus cooch uh, extension. So all those things will come in time. Um, all that said, this is this is the this isometric view uh, of the short span. And so if we go to the next picture. It has a comparable graphic of where are its columns shown in red relative to the geotechnical hazard zone. And in comparison to the seismic retrofit, there are many fewer columns in the seismic retrofit zone. You can actually go longer with more modern construction um, 
and it placed fewer columns in that zone that you would have to create these islands of resistance to this you know, underground mitigation. And so that's a meaningful difference between the two um, alternatives. It looks like there might be a question. Yeah, it looks like Bill's got a question on whether there's um, any historical data on which type of bridge a lift or bath that are able to handle a seismic event. Fantastic question, and it's one that we've been debating within the engineering team for quite a while. And there are, um, I'm going to say at this point, no, but the devil's in the details. Um, for this kind of a special design criteria where we expect this bridge to be immediately operable following the large magnitude 9 event, um, there are pros and cons to a lift bridge and a connection at four different corners versus a bascule bridge, which uh, might weigh a little more uh, and would have to seat itself at the proper location. So it's something that uh, it's one of the key reasons why we don't want to necessarily uh, have a selection between lift and bascule at this point. Much more analysis should be done uh, as part of the type selection phase to help answer that question. So time will tell on the particular seismic design criteria as it relates to the lift versus the bascule. Is there, looks like there might be another question. There's a comment um, saying that on the east side, it looks like almost all the supports are in the hazard zone. Uh, that's correct for the piece that you see. Now, what you don't see is extending off into the sort of grade color. You can maybe see a little hint of red um, there still are another two sets of columns or a column and an abutment that goes beyond. And just like on the west side, you can see some, um, some columns that are outside of this sort of light orange color where you're into harder material, where you're not as, you're not as prone to this geotechnical hazard. So, so there, within this space here, there, there are more. Um, then for the long span, which is what prompted us to get into this long span that we'll show here in a few slides of how do you minimize the number of supports in that geotechnical hazard zone. Okay. And so similar to the retrofit, this is a view of the short span replacement. And um, what you can see is because we are extending the span lengths themselves relative to the seismic retrofit, again, built in the 1920s. Today's, you know, sort of modern bridge construction is able to, or you're able to expand and, and use fewer columns in the park. Um, but you still need to have at least one set of columns in between uh, where Natal Parkway is and the river. So while it definitely improves, there still are some columns. Um, in the in Waterfront Park, but it's a definite improvement overall to opening up that space underneath. And now we're looking again at the view of this of the short span that's on the far east side, and you get a close-up view to where those columns are placed, similar to the comment that was just made. Yes, quite a few of those still remain in that geotechnical hazard zone. Um, this span arrangement is very similar to what we did in the retrofit over the freeway, just because you have uh, comparable span lengths. It's, it's what's happening beyond that is where the key difference is. And once again, you can see that, that there is the uh, East Bank Esplanade access bridge. And in the bottom right corner, you can see the picture that's uh, looking at Second Avenue towards the skate park. And in this case, the skate park is preserved because of where we're placing our columns. We're actually spanning over the top of it um, with if there is no temporary bridge. And there, there are some impacts to the skate park if there's a temporary bridge, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. And so with that, I think uh, Jeff was going to maybe talk about some other features on slide 27. Thanks, Dave. Um, yeah, one of the things I I feel like we didn't say earlier that's important, or maybe at least didn't emphasize, is with the replacement alternatives. Um, they during construction, uh, the because of the the what's happening on the west end, 
So it's not really, it's not in this slide, but happening on the West End near Portland Rescue Mission, the social service agencies, their providers, construction of the retrofit requires at least a short-term closure of the access to Portland Rescue Mission, the client access right up, right up of Burnside Street off of the sidewalk itself. The replacement alternatives, start, starting with this short span, and it's the same for all the replacement alternatives, can avoid that temporary closure. I believe the closure is estimated at this point of two to three months that those access doors would need to be closed, um, access would need to be blocked as part of the retrofit construction. This alternative, as well as the other replacement alternatives, avoid that. that that's a pretty critical impact. Uh, it's gonna, it's a, it's a big deal, certainly for the EIS, for the environmental justice and equity evaluation, important differentiator that I forgot to mention earlier. Um, then, sorry, Cass, if you could go back to that last slide that we were at before with white stag sign. Just a quick reminder that like the retrofit, the, the short span, the replacement short span would also avoid um, any new impacts on views of the, the white stag sign. Now that that's just looking at the bridge itself. That's ignoring for now the bridge, the type of movable span. We know that a you know vertical lift, for example, has much higher, much more vertical elements to it, per permanent vertical elements. So there could be some effect on some views if a, a central lift or if a vertical lift is chosen for the movable span. Again, as Steve noted, that's not a decision we're trying to make today. That's it. All right, we're finally at the long span. Um, so this is the uh, view of the long span. Oh, it looks like we might have a question before we get into this. Yeah, Art's asking if the height of the bridge is the same for the long span and the short span. Uh, the answer is yes, the deck level is is about the same, regardless of the alternative that we have. We're doing uh, the most we can to pervert, to preserve accesses to all of the different buildings in all four quadrants. Um, and part of that is maintaining a a deck elevation as you know similar to what's out there today as possible. If for some of the alternatives, because of the nature, especially and this is really for the huge extension, because of the way the s curve frames off, You'll have to gain a little bit of a clearance before you come back down, um, especially over third, but but consider them all roughly about the same elevation as they are today at the deck level. Steve, the, the vertical clearance under the long span would be a little bit greater, isn't that right, compared to short span? I, yeah, I'll, I'll talk about that when we get to, I think maybe they even two or three slides from now where we're starting to see clearances. So. Uh, so with this long, but, I, but thanks for bringing that up, Jeff. Um, so with this long span, the key difference here is you have a single span, calling the long span, that goes from the uh, piers in the river all the way out to the end of wherever the arch is. And so that is just one continuous span without any supports underneath. And so that means in the foreground, there won't be any supports in Waterfront Park until you get to your columns right adjacent to Natal Parkway. In the background, as you move to the east side of the river, and we have some other pictures with close-ups, you won't have any columns until you get effectively near 2nd Avenue, or plus or minus near 2nd Avenue. And so it, it removes a lot of those columns in that large geotechnical hazard zone. Um, this, this Steve, part... back up. We just lost about uh, half a minute of dialogue. Would you back up and recover that, please? Oh, I'm sorry. You just want to hear me now. What happened? So hopefully you can hear me now. Um, so I'll yes, say. Go ahead. Thank you. Oh, okay. So thanks for thanks for letting me know. Um, so effectively, the the long span is from the water piers to some column where the end of the arch uh, terminates. So in the foreground, it would be right near Natal Parkway. And in the background, um, it goes all the way from the in-water pier to beyond the railroad tracks with no columns in between. That's effectively what I was saying. Um, 
one thing I did not say is this arch is just one type of long span. It could be represented by some other types, a cable stay, you know, as we're go to the next slide. And the cable stay, if you zoom in um, to either end, it's the bottom picture, it's truly something that's comparable to the Tillamook, maybe a little taller in this case because the span lengths are a little larger and the widths are a little wider. But there's multiple types of longer span bridge types that serve the purpose. And the point to all of this is so that you eliminate those intermediate columns where there is a reason to do so. And in this case, it's because of the ge geotechnical um, hazard zones. But also it helps in avoiding putting columns in and around the freeway, which is always a complication, around the railroad tracks, inside of the river itself, or um, that's on the east side or on the west side, it's within Waterfront Park. And so in the picture that we have in front of us now, you can really see if you start counting the number of supports that are in red, there's only one at the extreme east end of that geotechnical hazard zone on the east side. And all of the supports on the west side are outside of that uh, orange ribbon geotechnical hazard zone. And so there's, there's, this was the reason for investigating this long span. This is the reason why when we had the original in-kind replacement looking at this option, there is enough difference between the two that we said it deserves to be its own alternative. So, so while um, it's sort of a spin-off, really it's something that we've been talking about for quite a while. And um, let's see. Yes, so I think uh, Bill asked, the tight arch option, uh, a cable stay option would have a slightly different pier location. You can see it in this picture. And in fact, we're exploring whether the current pier location shown in this picture makes the most sense, or should it actually be located further to the east, which means that it has um, a slightly taller tower, <clears throat> and uh, but is still constructible between the, between the freeway lanes. I'm going to pause there because I know that there are a few comments I want to make sure. So um, looks like Fred had a question on whether the Pacific Fruit uh, Pacific Coast Fruit Company property is less impacted with the long span. The question is is possibly, or the answer is possibly, um, but we want to be a little conservative about that right now. One of the things that comes with having multiple columns inside of that. A geotechnical hazard zone is you have to treat the way you do your soil improvement differently. When you have multiple columns or the closer that you get to the to the river, the more soil behind it you have to keep from moving into the river and taking the cures with you. And so because of that, you might have a different kind of soil improvement technique that one might extend out further north and south versus what's being shown in this picture, where if you move further to the east, you have less soil to displace, and so it might shrink. If we can demonstrate that um, through analysis in the future, well, then the answer is maybe there's less impact, but we can't rely on that today because we just don't have all the data. But that's where, should this alternative be selected, that's some of the analysis that we go forward as part of type selection. Thanks, Steve. Um, Sharon and Ed, you've, you've turned your camera on. I'm not sure if that means that you have a question. Go right ahead if you do. I think you're on mute. You might need to unmute yourself. We got okay. it. Yeah, this is Ed. Uh, Steve kind of made the point that uh, I wanted to emphasize a little. Uh, if we could go back to the picture of the on, on slide 30, cable stayed concept, which I think is going to be popular with a lot of people because of the appearance. Uh, the, as Steve mentioned, the location of the towers, sometimes called pylons, on the on the east uh, cable stayed structure, uh, that th those towers are located right in the middle of that freeway interchange where one where one ramp goes off the I-84 and the other goes to I-5. Uh, that would be extremely difficult to build and without 
shutting the freeways down, it would be an enormous foundations there. And as Steve pointed out, maybe it's possible to move that tower to the east to avoid that. But uh, certainly, I think that would be what, what happens to those towers would be a big factor in deciding whether that's uh, just how viable this uh, table stayed concept is, even though it's certainly attractive from other standpoints. That's all I had. Yeah, so Ed, um, just recently within the last week or so, we've come to the conclusion that we feel we can move those move those towers to at least from a feasibility standpoint. Um, so one of the things that will be showing up in some of the visual analysis as we move closer to a DEIS is an, is this, you know, sort of sub option to the long span that has the towers placed to the east of the railroad, which means they get taller and closer to um, the yard, that big, you know, new black building that's on the east side. So, so that was good news from a feasibility standpoint. Um, there's quite a few other items that come along with it. You know, the taller the towers, the longer the span, the more expensive it is. So, so that's why the point to the long span isn't so much that we're picking, oh, it should be an arch versus a cable stay. It's more about the family of options that comes with it. No different than for the movable span, we'll be, we would be looking at with the long span, a bascule and a lift, even though we're only showing a bascule in this picture. So it's about the, the features and attributes of a long span rather than the actual bridge type itself. And so that's why I want to keep accentuating that point. It looks like we had another question from Art, um, just asking if you could speak to the possible cost differences in those two long span options. Yeah, so so generally speaking, uh, cable stays or the one on the bottom are more expensive than the tight arch, the ones at the top. The big caveat to all of that, though, is constructability and construction method, and um, there's a difference as you look at you know the tight arch on the left span versus the right span. The left span well, that's short enough where you can contemplate barging something in and floating it into place and, and launching it. However, the much longer span on the east side doesn't really enable you to, to barge and bring in. You'd have to erect it in pieces. And there's a whole slew of different construction techniques um, that yield how do you build that. And that con those construction techniques and how do you maintain traffic and all that are the elements that drive cost. So. So on the surface, I would say that the the um, cable stay is a little more expensive than the tight arch, but that's something that we'll be getting into. The big takeaway, though, is the cost increase that goes with the superstructure is offset by the savings by not having all of the foundation work in the ground in that geotechnical zone. And that's one of the reasons why, even when you're comparing these structures to the short span equivalent of the replacement, these are still cheaper. It looks like there might be another question. Yeah, I think that there's a comment from um, Susan just saying how much more Steve, because those big arches are hard to see through. Um, and Susan, I don't know if you want to elaborate on that or if we should note that and keep moving. Yeah, so um, the point of visual and seeing through uh, these different alternatives um, those are things that, to some degree, are difficult to represent in these very preliminary 3D drawings. And that's something that, you know, should that alternative go forward, one of the questions is how, how true to life would these uh, uh, large span visuals be? And, and we would start moving into other renderings. So we would do that regardless of which alternative is selected and start creating more true to life renderings. Not that these aren't great the way they are. But I think the picture that you have in front of you right now, slide 32, is a pretty good illustration of what you would typically see with cable type structures. I mean, yes, there's a, a larger rib on top, um, but the cables themselves and the way that you want to feature those cables are a bit of an, uh, an aesthetic element. Oftentimes, just like on the Tilikum, they're, they're white and they're meant to provide a look, a very modern look and stand out and then be lit by lighting. Other times you can diminish the, the scale of those 
to try to diminish that look and see through it more. So, so it's a little bit of an aesthetic question, a little bit of a funnel design question, um, and it's something that would be explored further is if this loft bed option was was progressed. And looks like this uh, this talk of arches is heating things up in the chat. So we have a comment from Bill asking or question asking if two smaller arches with one foundation in the geohazard zone um, could be constructed elsewhere and barged in. And I think Susan's also asked if we can go back and see that slide again. There we go. Um, there we go. Uh, so there can be other arrangements that for the east side get you into smaller, um, longer spans, if you will. But again, the more spans you have, the more uh, foundations you introduce in that geotechnical hazard zone, and the more it diminishes the intent around it. Um, one of the challenges is with the east side is as you're trying to span all the way over the various freeway lanes, whether it's I-5, I-84, and then ultimately the railroad, if you're trying to avoid putting foundations in, you'd want to go beyond that. And there isn't that much space beyond. Um, so it's something that can be looked at as part of span configuration should the long span option be selected. Uh, but there are definitely trade-offs that come with adding um, other or shorter longer spans on that east side. Okay, I think we can keep moving forward. Okay, and then the last point I want to make on this particular view, and you'll see the next view will be with the uh, cable stay option, is what Jeff um, mentioned earlier, is the amount of space underneath the bridge so not only is there no column, so that it opens up the entire length and um, the wall that you see in the background is actually the pier in the river. So there really is nothing from the supports right near NATO Parkway in the foreground all the way to the edge of the seawall. Um, so it's not only that length under the bridge, but also the height. So because most of your superstructure is above the deck, it really does enable you to minimize the depth of the the deck itself down to something that actually gains space relative to what might be out there today or is comparable today. It's certainly um, more space than what would be there for the short span version of this. And if you go to the next slide, <clears throat> you'll see the same uh, view but with the cable stay. In this case, the towers uh, would have to be moved into the park and that's because you need to have some form of um, the long span in front that gets out to the river and a back span of cables, which means you're essentially kind of balancing your cables on either side of your tower. And then there's also a transition that um, has to occur just on the other side of Natal Parkway. There will be some effectively columns on the other side of Natal Parkway. And then beyond that to the west is the more conventional structure, no different than the short span. So with that, I think um, Jeff is, oh, if we can stay on slide 33. Uh, Jeff has a number of points that um, I think from a vertical, from a septate principle standpoint that he, he can talk about. Thanks, Steve. Um, yeah, a couple, the, as, as Steve noted, the whole origin of the long span option uh, came to be because of the concern about the geotechnical hazard area, and initially, we we thought that was the that was going to be the primary benefit of the long span. Uh, as we got looking at it more, so we got the designs from the engineering team and started looking more at what it meant underneath the bridge. Um, a number of other advantages became pretty clear. Uh, as he mentioned, the idea, uh, the ability to have fewer columns. Here in Waterfront Park, uh, it was something we've heard from Portland Parks is an advantage from their point of view, um, as well as a number of other people. It's it's sight lines is one thing. You just op more open space for park users themselves. Um, and if you remember, we had you you all chose a criteria. It was called uh, crime prevention and personal security, and it was about measuring or trying to evaluate the impacts of the different alternatives on. The SEPTED principles, 
crime prevention through environmental design. And the, the main principle that we, we have the ability to look at and evaluate to some extent at this point is the idea of natural surveillance. That the more open an area is, especially if it's open to the ability of walkers or bicyclists or people strolling or sitting on park benches um, or um, you know, just present in the area to be able to see more of that area, then it, it tends to be uh, much more favorable in terms of reducing personal security risk, reducing the, the uh, risk of crime. So that's one of the, besides the idea of more open space under the park for people to use, it also is likely to uh, reduce risk associated with, with crime and, and make it potentially a safer place. Another thing I wanted to mention, not directly here, but it's somewhat related, is that the, the long span has a shorter duration closure of the esplanade on the east side because of the construction uh, approach, construction methods would, would be different. It's about eight months, eight months shorter duration closure compared to the retrofit. And it's about a full year shorter duration closure compared to the other replacement alternatives, the short span. And if you could go to the next slide, Cassie. This shows more simulations of the white stag sign and the views. Uh, you see the ones on the left are the arch, uh, tight arch option for the long span. On the right are the cable stayed options. Um, there are the impacts for people on the south side of the bridge. Uh, so it would be really people walking uh, eastbound along the south edge of the bridge. They're going to have the, the greatest impact when it comes to ped bike. They'll intermittently see cables, the tie, the ties on the arch itself, and then at a couple points, there'll be the arch, the arch where it touches down and comes through the deck will, will be obstructing the view. Um, the cable stay itself, it has, you know, the, the cables and then the towers in the middle, there'll be some obstruction of views. Our, our landscape architects who are doing the visual and aesthetics resource assessment, they've called it, um, it changes it to a dynamic view. And what they meant by that is particularly for people driving, you still see you still see a lot of the white stag sign, but it's intermittently being interrupted uh, by the, the short view, the short distance view of uh, the cables and, and the towers you go by. For the westbound ped bike lane, there is little or no disruption of the view looking towards the white stag sign. And when we looked at I-5 and some I-84 ramps, there's very little effect on those views, except there's a, there's a section on the Esplanade itself, south of the bridge, where uh, you get kind of a peekaboo view of, of the White Stag sign, and it's uh, a slight interruption of that view, depending on where you're at. The urban design working group that we met with to get their input, they helped they provided that advice on the visual criteria that you all adopted, criterion methods. Um, essentially, we're looking at visual aesthetics from two standpoints. One is what's the effect of the alternative on existing urban design features and views? And the long span scores the, scores the lowest of any alternative. It, it has the lowest possible score because of the above deck structure. The other aspect of visual and aesthetics is what's the potential for new visual opportunities from the alternatives, and that's where the long span scores the highest. And obviously, that's going to be the details of the bridge type will be decided as part of the bridge type study coming up later this year, starting later this year. But the detailed aesthetics of it won't happen until final design. So this this will clearly be an issue that's. Um, that will continue through all the all the remaining phases of the project. So Jeff, looks like there's a question um, from Susan in the chat, uh, noting that these views are are looking west, and um, is there an impact on the east that's factored in as well? Um, and then Bill's asking if we could show the oblique downstream view of the Cable State Bridge again. Uh, Susan, did you mean? Uh an impact of resources on the east side looking through the bridge. I'm thinking that's probably what you meant. We're 
when you're talking, I don't know who have I got here, Steve or who's this is Jeff. Jeff. Um, my little screen doesn't show barely anything. Um, these views kind of showing the impact on uh, the visual or the site, all, they all point west. And uh, as though we're always looking at downtown, but uh, so the views don't show what it would be looking like looking east. Yes, that's that's true. We we do have some simulations of that. We could probably scroll back. I think we might have some in here. Let me double double check. We sh we're showing this one because this was the primary concern we heard in the last right. CTF no, meeting. I, I understand. You've got big pink, and you've got you've got big pink and Montgomery Park, and you've got the other uh, the the sign. But in one of these constructs, you've got a very large arch piece going over there on the east side. And uh, um, so I was just sort of wondering about the views looking east. Yeah, and Cassie, maybe you could pull up a slide that show, shows that a little bit better. Jeff, on slide 35, you may have a hint of it if you want to keep going and then while Cassie is maybe hunting for something. Good. Which slide? There we go. Oh yeah, there you go. That's the one that shows it pretty well. So this is this is kind of a drone view though. Um, uh, on the upper one, the one down below looks like is that from what's that viewpoint from, Steve, on the lower right? That's Second Avenue. Is that down on Second Avenue? Yes, this is Second Avenue looking essentially at the yard building you can see underneath the bridge is the Burnside skate park. Yeah, so you can see that at least from here, the arch touches down before you get that far west, or, for, or sorry, that far east. The cable stay, if you can see the cable stay, the cable stay option continues much farther east than this. In fact, the, the probably the revision to the design that Steve was talking about where we might move that tower for the cable stay the east would put, I believe, the cables touching down very close to about where the bridge um, abuts the abuts the uh, the yard itself, the yard building. Yeah, that's right. If I could jump in, Jeff. So with um, with the cable stay, which is not what we're showing, uh, we don't have a view of that in this presentation. It would it would um, land. If you look at the bottom right, it would land those cables uh, touching down all the way to effectively um, above where the Burnside Skate Park is. So, so you would actually not have to have this uh, column set right by Second Avenue. It would uh, your tower would be further to the left of the picture, and then the cables would run further back. So, so for that option, it would that's how it would frame out. It would still have just a single tower in that uh, geotech hazard zone. It's just where it's placed would be different and has frames in it would be different. So, so those graphics um, are being developed as part of the visual assessment process. So folks, just a little bit uh, of a- Did Bill have there. a question? I think Bill was asking for an additional uh, view on the, um, uh, on the PowerPoint, but for for purposes of time, we, we have about a half an hour left, a little less than half an hour left in our meeting time. And I'm guessing we'll have um, time for a little bit of discussion and, and additional questions. But Steve and Jeff, just wanted to give you a heads up. I know we have a number of slides to get through still. Thanks. The, the only other thing I wanted to add is the Long span, uh, another advantage of being able to have fewer columns underneath the deck is it eliminates uh, some fill, some columns that with all the other alternatives have a pier in the water, an additional pier in the water right between the esplanade and the shoreline and the long span would eliminate that. So it, it's an advantage from a natural resource habitat, potential for flood elevation impacts. Okay, if there are no questions, we can move on to the next concept, alternative.
Yep, go right ahead, Steve. Okay, next slide, please. Kathy, let me know if you can update the slide. Nelson? I can hear you, yep. Um, Kathy, is it possible to advance the slide? Also, I think somebody's typing and we can hear you typing. So just make sure you're on mute if you're not presenting. <laughs> well, they're busy Kathy, typing. Are you, there? are you guys able to hear me or? Now we can. Okay. Yeah. Okay, and is the slide advancing? No. Slide 36 you need. So Cassie, I have my presentation teed up if you want me to take control of the presentation. That would be great, thank you. Okay. Um, real quick question, this is Cameron, while we're waiting to figure all this out. Um, I'm assuming the answer is no, but have we considered combining the Cooch connection with the long span or is does the nature of the long span prevent uh, Cooch connection being included in that design? Right, so we have, well, it's a great, great question as we're getting into uh, this view. Let me uh, talk, first, can you guys all see my screen? Yes, yeah, we can see your screen. Slide. Okay, so I will, let me pause one slide to get there. The answer is we did look at that and um, to see, could you have a long span option with the Cooch extension, but because of this leg that extends to the north, it became basically infeasible to do so. So I'll talk about this and then we'll move to a graphic that has a view that I think can better explain that. So, so the Cooch extension itself is really from the in-water piers all the way to the west is the exact same as the short span. So the only real difference is what's happening on the east side. And so as, oops, as I move to the east side, um, or move to the view that shows the geotechnical hazard zone, you can see all of the columns that are in it. And that's one of the major uh, challenges that comes with this option is actually worse when you, when you actually do a physical count of the uh, supports in this geotechnical hazard zone than even the retrofit. It just has more columns that have to, have to be um, mitigated through some soil mitigation. Now, in this view here, you can see um, the curvature, this sort of slight S-shaped curve to the north leg. To have a long span, you would actually have to have two different long spans uh, that frame and, and almost come in diagonally tying into the in-water pier. And because of the curvature and that being a single span, you'd actually have to make it so wide that it's almost cost prohibitive to the point where um, it's just wholly um, conflicting with the other long span as it frames in. So, so one is there's just an overall cost uh, premium that goes with it that seems to negate the value of even having a long span. Two is you have these two different very tall structures that are framing in and then three, it creates a massive visual impairment to the yard building that's being almost surrounded by the two legs of this Cooch extension. So while we looked at it, we didn't feel it was feasible. All right. And let me go to the next slide. So on this next slide is um, a view on the waterfront park side, and it really is the exact same as the short span alternative. So I won't spend a lot of time on it. The real difference is here on the east side, uh, where we have the uh, 
different views of how the two legs are uh, framing across the freeway. And you can see that now you're putting columns not at just one location, but at two locations between the different freeway ramps and along the railroad track and eventually along second. Um, and while they're narrower than the single bridge option on Burnside Street, it results in overall a slight increase in, in bridge width just because of the nature of building additional barriers and providing for um, the room for bikes and pets. And as you can see in the upper left-hand picture, it does frame in to um, the Cooch extension uh, to the north and um, has effectively uh, the same vertical clearances over second and third is what's, what's out there today. Uh, but we would have to lower Third Avenue. And so with that, um, well, I'll go one more slide. And so this is a view um, along Second Avenue looking north. So the skate park is on your right-hand side. <clears throat> and you can see the two bridges, one in the foreground, which is where Burnside, Burnside Street is, and then one in the background where, where the Cooch um, extension would exist. And in this picture, you can see um, even more open space underneath the bridge because the consequence of having this Cooch extension is even more of an impact to, um, to the buildings on either side. And so with that, Jeff, I think you were going to have some other points. Yeah, I just wanted to add a couple about the, the visual aesthetics uh, team looked at one of the things they noted about Cooch was um, the uh, it eliminates that existing public courtyard. It's kind of a pet pedestrian bike connection as well that extends between third and uh, from third down to second. It's gone because of the that new viaduct. There it is. Yeah, the new viaduct, the extension of Cooch through those buildings eliminates that public courtyard. Um, it also, as uh, Peter Fry pointed out, that while um, some people consider eliminating the S curve on Cooch to be possibly an advantage from a, a transportation standpoint, people get through there faster. He noted that that is that's a pretty uh, uh, characteristic urban design feature for the east side of Portland. Um, the, that S curve, the, what it does with the, the views and the changing of the views and the uh, sort of the gateway that you get as you come around that corner and then uh, uh, come around that curve on, on Cooch heading eastbound, make that left S curve and then get into the open space where Burnside Bridge is. This eliminates that and that uh, obviously that's in the eye of the beholder, but it is a known and recognized urban design feature on the east side that would be eliminated. And as Steve pointed out, the lowering of Third Avenue, one of the impacts of that too is it complicates some of the access points for uh, businesses and a residential building off of Third Avenue. The street has to be lowered now to the different ele elevation than, than the sidewalk itself. And that's it in terms of the differentiators I wanted to know. And with that, Allison, I think we're back to you. Yeah. So we um, had hoped that we would have time in this meeting to be able to uh, to have some discussion and to vote on a preferred alternative. We have 15 minutes left in this meeting, and we haven't talked about um, traffic options yet during construction. So I want to open it up for some any questions that folks might have. Um, we took some throughout that presentation and uh, hopefully give Jeff and Steve some time to walk through those traffic options as well. But it looks like we're gonna be tabling the opportunity to vote until the June meeting. That also means that you have more time to kind of sit with this information. It's a lot of analysis, it's a lot of stuff, um, and come back to it and ask questions um, of the project team in between now and the next meeting in June. Um, so Bill, looks like you have a question that you've popped into the chat. Um, and you're asking, uh, considering the length of time of construction, is time solely dependent on the in-water work period? Or if the contractor was incentivized pro appropriately, uh, could significant construction time be saved? I don't know, Steve, if you want to weigh in on that one. Yeah, I, 
good question. Um, so the construction duration it, it is, is driven by the in-water work periods. So even with incentivization, you can it's going to be hard to uh, get out of the reality of how many in-water work windows it's going to take to build your temporary works to actually in, develop your casings or cofferdam, whichever the solution ends up being, and then ultimately um, constructing and then pulling everything out. So it's driven by the in-water work periods, and there's not a whole lot that can be done uh, to incentivize. Although I will say there's a, we'll put a little pin in that because with the a contractor, there's oftentimes the ability to uh, create innovative innovative solutions, especially if it's a CMGC or other kind of alternative delivery process. The reality is I wouldn't expect it to change very much um, just because of the nature of what the in water work is. So Steve, I'm wondering, do you think we could talk about traffic options in 10 minutes or is that doing a disservice to the content of the information? I believe we can. And the reason for that is because we talk about it so often and we, I don't think there's going to be a lot of new materials really rolling through um, existing materials. So without that, this is jump right in. So uh, in terms of the traffic options, this is no different than what you guys have been seeing for probably 13 of those 15 different CTF meetings so far. Um, the full bridge closure and the temporary bridge itself with the full bridge traffic to be detoured to other locations and temporary bridge would be um, either a the same temporary bridge we talked about before or some smaller version of it. Uh, so this is a reminder of what the scoring results showed uh, from all of the all the different criteria, ratings, and weighting factors, with the difference again being the higher scores were always with the option that had a full closure and in large part that's because of the benefit that comes with reduced overall construction duration and less impacts in the water uh, and overall less impacts that come with um, having a temporary bridge. Um, and I'm seeing some, so I'm going to run through these and then maybe we can catch up on the questions at the end. So with the highlights, um, this is what we've talked about before in terms of the additional one and a half or two years on whether there's a full bridge closure or a temporary bridge. We've talked already about the cost difference, and this is where you highlight the areas that are shaded and that 90 to $95 million is that difference associated with a temporary bridge relative to the lower cost that goes with a full bridge closure. Now, one of the key features that comes with a temporary bridge is the fact that there are some complications on either end of the project. And so one of those complications comes around and over the, the skate park. So when you're building in a temporary bridge, you have to frame it in and do stage construction. And part of that is an impact of the skate park itself. It's not a full demolition, but it's a partial demolition because of what you have to do to frame your temporary work into the existing ends. And this is outside of a long span. Um, so this would be regardless of whether it's a long span or short span or um, uh, for the replacement alternatives, it would, it would have some part of a skate park demolition, which then would be built at the end of the, of the replacement alternative. Um, this is the picture itself of what it means to have a temporary bridge. And this is all of the work, and this helps to, I guess, address uh, the point or the question that Bill asked about the, the amount of in-water work and why would that be driving the schedule? It's just because the sheer volume of it. And there's, with the temporary bridge comes all the work and material associated with the temporary bridge, whether it's impact to the trees along Waterfront Park, whether it's impact to the canopy that's in Waterfront Park and spanning over the cross, or across the Ankeny pump station, putting in temporary piers in the water in addition to all of the contractor work that's shown in gray, the building of the uh, movable temporary bridge. And in some cases, it means there has to be tug assist because of the scale of the vessels that would have to cross underneath. Um, removing part of the East Bank Esplanade because of the nature of putting in the bridge itself and gaining access to the spans, depending on which alternative is needed, let alone building 
in and around the freeway, the railroad, and then tying back in. So there's just a lot of complications that come with this temporary bridge, which is why that $90 million cost and that extra one and a half to two years exists. So with that, I think I ran through it in less than 10 minutes. <laughs> I'll uh, hand it back over uh, for any sort of questions that came up. So we did have two questions that came into the chat. Um, one was from Fred asking if you could explain a little bit about the sensitivity analysis that was applied um, to see if there are any differences in the rating factors that changed because of that. Okay. Um, so one of the things that we did is we went back and we promised when you guys were doing your weighting factors, we'll do sensitivity analyses across all the different criteria. And so the takeaway is regardless of how we prioritized each of the different criteria, the same conclusion came out that the highest score was the long span alternative with a full closure. It's just the question was how much did that um, score change or how much greater was that number compared to all the rest. And in some cases it grew wider, in some cases it eh, reduced the touch, but generally speaking, it was um, always in line with these different uh, ranges that are shown on the screen. Um, and we even tried to do pairings. So we said EJ and bikes and peds and sustainability. What about we, we maximize the weighting factors of those and thereby reduced all the others appropriately and it still came out the same. So, so in every case of sensitivity analysis, it showed the same conclusion. This basic chart is showing that the, that the long span full closure had the highest score. There's also a question from Cameron asking if there's any difference between the height or span of the different options in terms of marine traffic. So in terms of, um, all, for all the options, if it's a bath school, it's really the same bath school. Um, with the same same clearance criteria. For the lift span, it's always the same criteria for the lift span. Um, so in, in those cases, we would be having at least 147 feet above the ordinary high water, or um, really that's the, the clearance that is being controlled, and that's greater than or equal to what's out there today in terms of uh, what would what would be reconstructed. If there's a temporary bridge, that temporary bridge is really the same um, opening size that for any of the alternatives. The only difference is the length that you would have to pass underneath the bridge is slightly larger for the seismic retrofit because of where we're putting the seismic retrofit foundation improvements, which is on the outsides of the bridge. So in that case, your tunnel effect is longer. The openings is the same, the tunnel effect is longer, and so we might have more tug assist. And uh, just to clarify on that, um, I just got a lot of questions from other voters concerned that you were going to narrow that span um, at all, and you're not currently planning on narrowing it versus what it is at today. No, we are not reducing the horizontal clearance. Thanks. We also have a question um, on whether the temp bridge would survive a seismic event. I'm sorry, the which bridge? Uh, the temp bridge. Oh, the temporary bridge. No, the temporary bridge is not is not going to be designed for a seismic event. Um, there's also a question uh, from Susan, just wondering how much uh, how much say would this group or or other groups have on the long sport long span support arch design type. Well, that's a fantastic question, and I think it segues into what we wanted to go next if we're not going to be um, looking to make any uh, preference decisions today. I think we ran out of time on that one. <laughs> so, as a precursor, so whatever, um, whatever alternative is advanced for, and if it's the long span, then there, I think you're going to see there's going to be an opportunity to be engaged in helping to answer that exact question. So with that, maybe Allison, I'll hand it back to you or to um, others who want to maybe address this. Sure. Well, maybe before before we get into that, we'll just kind of close our discussion piece um, on the bridge types. I appreciate folks chiming into the chat. Um, it looks like we will be coming back together in June. Um, so. 
just to, to ask CTF members, if you have additional questions about all the information that you heard today um, that will be helpful for you in being prepared for that discussion in June on um, recommending a preferred alternative, please reach out to the project team. Um, or if you have any specific questions that you would like uh, to be addressed in that meeting space with the whole group, uh, please send those ahead of time so that the group can, uh, the team can come prepared to answer those questions. So we're not voting uh, today, but we can come prepared for the next meeting to really have a robust conversation. I, I think it's safe to say it'll be light on the presentation, if there's any at all, and it will really be focused on um, helping you have a discussion and moving towards hopefully voting on a, a recommendation for a preferred alternative on the bridge type and on the, um, the whether or not a temporary bridge or the traffic um, impacts during construction. So uh, I think we have a couple of folks um, who want to weigh in on what the next steps look like and some of the upcoming meetings, but just suffice to say, CTF members, see you in June. Um, Mike's turned his video on, and I think Heather might also have something to say. Um, and Jackie's asking, um, can you send an email soliciting questions or comments so you can reply if we have a question and it would go to the right team member? Absolutely. I think that that's definitely possible. We want to make this as easy and painless as possible for you to get the information that you need. Um, so I think is this, let's talk a little bit about the upcoming meetings. Is that Heather or, or Mike? Well, I think I was going to go after Megan. Um, yeah. Go ahead. Why don't we have Heather run through upcoming meetings and then Mike, you close with a little bit of a teaser about how the CTF is involved in next steps. Sounds good. Okay. All right. Well, thanks. Uh, I know that was a lot of information that we went through tonight. So we will be getting back together on June 1st, 15th. Like Allison mentioned, um, for everything that you did see tonight, if you have clarifying questions, if there was information that you thought was missing that would help you to get to a decision, um, if there's something specifically you'd like to, us to bring back to you uh, to discuss further at our June meeting, um, please uh, email the project team, um, Kathy, and just let us know so that we can be well prepared for that meeting so we can have a really great discussion um, and have this committee get to a recommendation on our preferred alternative. And then after that, we will take your recommendation to our senior agency staff group, to the Multnomah County Board of Commissioners, and we'll have our outreach in August. We'll be back in September with that outreach, and then again into October uh, with your recommendation. So those are really the next steps that we have, Allison. And to ask Jeff and Dave, I believe a calendar invite was sent for June, and if it hasn't been, because, oh, I see, it's not on your calendar, yes. Uh, Jackie, we will uh, get one out um, tomorrow, so everybody has it on their calendar. That's great, thank you. Um, Megan? Megan uh, and Mike? Yeah, I think Megan was... Yeah, I'm just I'm just going to pass it over to Mike. I think you, uh, the group has heard a lot about uh, the upcoming type selection phase today through Steve's discussion and the images. So I'm just going to, uh, since Susan asked, I think Mike is, I think it's just perfect if Mike just addresses how the CTF is going to be involved in what that process looks like. Thanks, Megan. Um, as somebody said, this is meeting number 15 for this phase of the project of your group. Before this phase, we had the feasibility study, which was another six meetings or so. So some of you have been with us on a long journey. We really appreciate your time. Uh, I wanted to kind of let you know if you're thinking like, how long did I sign up for here? Um, some options moving forward, including uh, to address Susan's question. So um, we will continue with a community task force during the bridge type selection phase which really uh, starts to kick off uh, at the September meeting where we start to talk about how that's all gonna lay out. So um, after the bridge type selection phase, we'll also have a design phase and we uh, would typically continue with the community task force through that. Now, once we start building this bridge, whatever we're gonna do, 
we typically don't have a task force uh, that meets during that phase. It's the issues tend to be more uh, for the neighbors. And of course, we bring everybody back and do some construction tours to show you how it's going. But uh, task forces usually don't continue into the during construction. So um, when you guys recommend your preferred alternative, which we would expect at the June meeting, that is a big milestone. And it's a little bit like when we finished the feasibility study about a year and a half ago. Um, that is a time when, if some of you are looking to go on to other things in life, uh, that, that would be sort of a natural time to, uh, to depart the uh, task force. Although we would love it if people could stay with us to at least that September meeting, because as um, Heather was saying, after you recommend your preferred alternative in June, we go out to the public in August, then we wanna bring that public input back to you guys in September at that meeting. And that's kind of your last chance to um, revise or alter the preferred alternative before in October, the policy group uh, considers what you said, what the public said, and they'll make a decision at that time. So if you're looking for a sort of an off ramp, you know, after that September meeting would be a logical time if you wanted to depart. Um, we'd love it if you stay. It's totally okay if you wanna stay or if you wanna leave. Um, for a lot of your groups, if you wanna leave, we'd probably look for somebody else to represent your organization. And we want to let you know for the bridge type selection phase, we're gonna probably try to recruit one or two uh, task force members who kind of come from the design world that um, we found with the Seller Bridge project, we had an architect who joined for the design phase and added a lot of um, good questions. Uh, somebody who's professionally, you know, deals with uh, design issues. So um, that's coming up. And during the summer, after the June meeting, we would follow up with people. They don't, nobody needs to decide now, or even in June. Uh, we'd reach out to you in the summertime, see where you are and if you want to stay or if you're ready to move on to, uh, I don't know, learning to play the guitar, writing your novel, whatever it is. So um, we want to thank you. 15 meetings is a big uh, commitment. Uh, we couldn't have gotten this far without you guys. Just want to let you know, you know, we're not expecting everybody to uh, sign on for three more years with us. But um, if you if you want, there's an opportunity. That's all. Any questions? Okay, I'll, I'll give it to you, Allison. All right. Well, Susan, thank you for your moment of levity in the chat, comparing that to the uh, Hotel California. It's appreciated. So I think that is concluding our, our meeting for this evening. Thank you all so much for your time, for your energy. We're ending four minutes late, uh, but we'll see you in June for what will hopefully be a robust conversation and uh, a recommendation moving forward. Thank you all so much. Um, we'll reach out, Kathy will be reaching out with